So far in our study of argumentation, we have only studied simple arguments with single lines of reasoning. A uh, line of reasoning is just a focused thread of support for a claim. So uh, any idea that supports a claim as well as the ideas that support that idea and the examples that support those ideas, that whole thread we call a line of reasoning. A line of reasoning is going to be made up of the claim plus at least one logical premise and then however many supporting premises and examples that support that one first logical premise. For example, this uh, very simple argument here has just one line of reasoning. Our claim is supported by a single premise. That premise is supported by a couple of examples, but we would call this whole thing, the premise and the two examples, that would be one line of reasoning. Of course, more sophisticated arguments, extended arguments within uh, a lot of the texts we've read, uh, they're going to feature more than just one line of reasoning. You're going to see multiple lines of reasoning uh, where that primary claim is supported by multiple premises, and those multiple premises are themselves supported by more premises and by examples. So the map of an extended argument might look something like this. We've got our central claim here at the bottom, and then we've got one, two, three different lines of reasoning branching off supporting that claim. I color coded them just to distinguish them. Our first line of reasoning is a single premise supported by a couple of examples. Our second line of reasoning is a premise supported itself by another premise, which is supported by a couple of examples. And then over here in purple, a premise supported by another premise illustrated by just one example. So there's a lot of different shapes that this can take, uh, but at its heart, we need to understand that uh, a primary claim in an extended argument is usually supported by multiple lines of reasoning. But before we get too far into the lesson, go ahead and stop, pause this uh, video rather, and reflect on the reflection question. Just write a paragraph, write informally and off the top of your head. So why are we studying this? Well, on the AP Lang exam, you'll need to be able to do a few things as far as identifying and analyzing argument structure goes. Uh, you'll need to be able to identify uh, the different structures of simple and extended arguments. Uh, for instance, be able to tell us how many lines of reasoning and what those lines of reasoning are. You'll also need to explain how various sentences and whole paragraphs within a text function within the larger structure of, uh, of extended arguments. So a question on the multiple choice section might ask you, you know, in paragraph four, how does it, how does it function uh, relative to the, the argument as a whole, something like that. Lastly, on the Q1 and Q3 essays, you need to be able to write extended arguments uh, in response to given topics uh, that feature clear lines of reasoning. And because it is an essay that you're writing, it needs to be an extended argument, so you will have multiple lines of reasoning that you will need to argue. In order to do all this, in order to be successful uh, either uh, analyzing or writing arguments on the AP Lang exam, you must be able to understand how arguments are structured. Okay? You need to get comfortable with mapping them uh, both physically and kind of uh, briefly in your head. You also need to build the vocabulary necessary to talk about argument structure. So let's look now at some key terms that you need to be able to know in order to talk about argument structure. There are two different ways that a claim can be supported, either through a premise, which is just a general idea stated as a truth that is used to support the claim, or through an example, which is a specific instance of something used to support a claim. The way that you can tell apart premises from examples is that premises rely on deductive reasoning. Deductive reasoning is the process of beginning with general ideas and from those uh, uh, leading to, or from those following them to rather specific conclusions. Okay? For instance, in this short argument here, the houses in this neighborhood sell very quickly because of the excellent schools nearby and the convenience to shopping.
because of the excellent schools nearby and the convenience to shopping. Those are two separate premises that support the claim that the houses in this neighborhood sell very quickly. We call them premises and not examples because they're not specific instances of something. They are just general statements of truth. And so if these statements are true, then they support our claim. Examples, on the other hand, rely on inductive reasoning, where you have specific instances that lead us to general conclusions about the larger group that you're trying to represent with those specific instances. For example, this is a, another simple argument. Uh, the houses in this neighborhood sell very quickly. A three-bedroom on Marigold Street sold after just four days on the market, and a four-bedroom over on Wheeler sold after just 36 hours. There, the claim is supported by a couple of different specific examples, specific instances of houses that did sell relatively quickly after being put on the market. So we would call these examples and not premises because they're specific instances and because they are demonstrating specific instances of what the claim is stating. Premises and examples provide two very necessary functions in arguments. Premises are used to argue how or why an idea is true, whereas examples are used to argue simply that an idea is true. Taking a look back at our first sample argument here, the houses in this neighborhood sell very quickly because of the excellent schools nearby and the convenience to shopping. Here are evidence, the two premises, uh, are giving two reasons why our claim is true. Yeah, why do the houses in this neighborhood sell quickly? Well, because of the excellent schools and because of the convenience to shopping. But looking at our second sample argument here, uh, the houses in this neighborhood sell very quickly. A three-bedroom on Marigold Street sold after just four days. A four-bedroom on Wheeler sold after 36 hours. Here are evidence, our couple of examples, uh, are giving two reasons that the claim is true. Yeah, the, the houses on this, on this neighborhood sell very quickly. Uh, for instance, the house on Marigold sold this fast. The house on Wheeler sold this fast. Those are each examples that demonstrate that this claim is true. An effective extended argument uh, will use a combination of both premises and examples. You really can't just rely on one or the other. Your lines of reasoning, however, in an extended argument, those should always be headed by premises. Uh, and that's because if they're headed by specific examples, there's no really space, there's no room to go any further than that. You've already gotten as specific as you can, uh, which, lead, which usually means that you've kind of skipped some logical steps in between. Uh, so premises should always support your, your main uh, or primary claim, and then those premises should be supported by additional premises and examples. If we were to combine the two arguments that we looked at together, it might look something like this. The houses in this neighborhood sell very quickly because there's convenient access to shopping, because there are excellent schools nearby. And then our two examples, I had to come up with a premise that they're supporting uh, because there is recent history of houses in this neighborhood selling very quickly. And then that premise is supported by the two specific examples we've already looked at. If I wanted to flesh out this argument further, I would of course need to provide some specific, maybe uh, some examples of that convenient shopping that's nearby, some examples of the uh, excellent schools that are nearby. That kind of thing would help uh, further flesh out this argument and strengthen it. Finally, just a note about thesis statements and your, your thesis. Uh, the thesis in an extended argument should be a combination of the primary claim that you have at the uh, bottom of an argument map and the premises that lead off each line of reasoning. So for instance, the thesis of that argument that we just looked at would be something like this. The houses in this neighborhood sell very quickly because there is convenient access to shopping and excellent schools and because there is a recent history of houses selling quickly. Let's go ahead and get into our first exercise now. You're going to read the op-ed by the New York Times editorial board titled Felons and the Right to Vote. 
then you're going to follow along with me in this video uh, to begin mapping an extended argument that the writers make in paragraphs one through six. Yeah, when you're finished with uh, with your argument map, just insert an image of what you've created uh, into your notes there. So this is kind of a different little exercise. Uh, pause the video so that you can read the text first, and then unpause the video and follow along with me as I map out this argument along with you. The first thing you need to do before we can start mapping the argument is to open up a new drawing in draw.io. Uh, you can do this on paper if you'd prefer. However, you're going to see right away that using draw.io will allow you to move things around very easily. And we're going to construct this argument map in pieces and then piece them together. So it's going to be a lot easier to do in draw.io. If you haven't used draw.io before, uh, now may be the time to finally watch that video that I've linked to a bunch of different assignments now. Uh, you can go ahead and pause this lesson and watch my short tutorial video uh, that I've linked here with the QR code. Uh, and that'll just show you the basics of how to uh, create a new document and how to uh, create uh, boxes within the, uh, within the program itself and how to link them together and that sort of thing. So uh, pause now and watch that video if you haven't, uh, if you're not familiar with the program. Okay, now we can begin mapping our argument. Make sure that you've read the text in its entirety. Uh, although we are going to map only the argument that is made across paragraphs 1 through 6. All right, the first step. We want to begin by identifying the primary claim for the extended argument. Usually this is somewhere in the first paragraph or towards the beginning of the argument, uh, and we just want to paraphrase that primary claim uh, as the first box on our argument map. So looking back at paragraph one, which of the statements in that paragraph most accurately makes the claim that is supported by the other paragraphs, by paragraphs two through six? While there are several claims made in that first paragraph, I think this last one here, that denying felons the vote has been a disaster, is the most accurate claim that governs all the ideas in the rest of our, our selection here. Uh, looking a little bit f further back, denying the vote to ex-offenders is anti-democratic and undermines the nation's commitment to rehabilitating people who have paid their debt to society. That sounds like it should be a pr our primary claim, but if we read the rest of the paragraphs, it's not just focused on how anti-democratic it is and it really doesn't say anything about undermining the nation's commitment to rehabilitating people who have paid their debt to society. Those could have been really good arguments to make but they don't make them. Instead they really just kind of generally argue how denying felons the vote has been a disaster. Um, and I, I know that because they only deal with examples that have happened in the recent past here. Uh, and so that makes most sense since this has, has been. Uh, that makes most sense as our, our primary claim. So on your argument map, just drag in a new box and type in that claim there. Denying felons the right to vote has been a disaster. Now that we have our primary claim, we want to examine the supporting arguments that are made to support that claim in each of the subsequent paragraphs. Yeah, these paragraphs contain our lines of reasoning used to support that primary claim. So a good exercise is just to go paragraph by paragraph and paraphrase the claims made in each argument within each paragraph into separate boxes. And once we have that list of claims, we can start piecing together how they support our primary claim. Yeah, these, these arguments in each of the remaining paragraphs, uh, those claims there will start the premise or will act as the premises that lead off our various lines of reasoning that we're trying to discover. So let's start with paragraph two. What would you say is the primary claim of paragraph two? Well, looking back at the text, there's really only one option. Yeah, the very first sentence just kind of gives us some background information on the fact that 35 different states prohibit at least some people from voting after they've been released from prison. Then the very next sentence actually gives us our claim. 
the rules about which felonies are covered and when the right to vote is restored vary widely from state to state and often defy logic. Okay. Now that claim is actually making a couple of separate statements, uh, but we're going to find a way to just kind of paraphrase it all into one statement um, because it really doesn't break down the various reasons or it really doesn't support the different ideas on how it varies and how it defies logic. It really just kind of um, supports the idea that it's, uh, that it's kind of random and defies logic. So on our argument map, we're just going to add another box and paraphrase that claim. Laws on felon voting are varied and illogical. I've colored the box green to kind of color code uh, the uh, paragraphs in the, uh, in the text, and that'll just help me uh, keep them all separate. All right, moving on to paragraph three. What would you say is the primary claim of paragraph three? Paragraph three is a little tricky because it doesn't actually have a stated claim. Yeah, aside from the fact that it says Florida may have changed the outcome of the 2000 presidential election, that is a sort of claim, but it's not a claim that's supporting our primary claim at all. It's it, it, The fact that Florida changed an election has nothing to do with supporting how uh, denying felons the right to vote has been a disaster. So that's not gonna be the claim that we're looking for. Instead, we need the claim that is implied by the two big examples that we have here. The fact that Catherine Harris back in 2000 uh, oversaw a purge of suspected felons that removed an untold number of eligible voters, and the fact that this year state officials are conducting a new purge that may be just as flawed. They've developed this list of 47,000 voters who may be felons, <laughs> Uh, who may not be as well. So we need to look at those two examples and ask ourselves, what is the claim that's being implied there by those two things? And here is how I would phrase that implied claim, that laws on felon voting are abused in order to suppress non-felon voters. Right, That's what those two examples suggest. Catherine Harris did it back in 2000 when she disenfranchised untold number of legal voters in her purge of, of so-called felon voters. Uh, and then it says that they're trying to do the same thing again, quote, this year, which we need to keep in mind, this text was written back in 2004. But that is the implied claim based on those two examples. Let's move on now to paragraph four. What would you say is the primary claim of paragraph four? Uh, paragraph four meets our expectations. We have the claim right there in the very first clause. Election officials are also far too secretive about felon voting issues. Notice that word also there. That's going to be important that we come back to. Also kind of implies that this uh, idea is a continuation of the idea in the previous paragraph. And it makes sense because if we look at paragraph four here, we see that the same two examples are used, but to support a different claim. This time the claim is that election officials are being secretive. So not only are they abusing this to suppress votes they're being secretive about it and we've got the two examples again from 2000 with Katherine Harris and this year 2004 with the 47,000 names on a new purge list so let's go ahead and put that on our next box and I'm going to color code this one purple I'm just picking colors here election officials are secretive about felon voting rights all right, go ahead and create the last two boxes on your own. Look at paragraphs five and six and identify the individual claim that is made in each paragraph that kind of governs the argument, the primary argument made in each paragraph. Go ahead and pause the video, make those boxes, and then come back and see how I did it. All right, just like paragraph four, paragraphs five and six both feature the claim right there up front in the very first sentence. Paragraph five, there is a stunning lack of information and transparency surrounding felon disenfranchisement across the country. And then uh, lastly, too often felon voting is seen as a partisan issue. Now that last one in paragraph six, we're gonna have to paraphrase a little bit more um, because again, just the, the fact that it is seen as a partisan issue, that doesn't support our primary claim. It's the fact that it's wheeled as a partisan weapon, uh, that is what the real claim is in that sentence. So we just need to do a bit of paraphrasing.
And so here we are. We've added our last two uh, premises, that there is a lack of transparency surrounding felon voting rights, and that felon voting has become a partisan issue. Uh, those five premises all work to support my primary claim there, that denying felons the right to vote has been a disaster. Next, we want to arrange these premises so that they each point down to the primary claim. And here's where we start to figure out what our actual lines of reasoning are. Uh, we also want to group any premises from multiple paragraphs that seem to both be arguing the same sort of thing uh, because they're both going to belong to the same line of reasoning. And so this can kind of look different to different people who are mapping this argument, but I'm going to show you how I kind of group them together. Lastly, in this step, we want to revise any wording or phrasing for maximum precision. So first things first, do you see any premises that could be grouped together under the same idea? I'm going to ask you to go back to what I asked you to remember earlier about paragraph four, starting with uh, or leading off with the uh, uh, adverb also. Okay, those two ideas are kind of connected together by evidence. Let's see, can we group them together as kind of under the same basic uh, idea or premise? Yeah, paragraph four, the claim was laws on felon voting are abused to suppress non-felon voters. And paragraph, uh, excuse me, that was paragraph three. Paragraph four was election officials are secretive about felon voting rights. I think overall, both of those uh, claim, or both of those arguments and both those paragraphs are really supporting the same idea. The fact that uh, these laws on felon voting are misused or used unjustly to get away with illegal legal things. The other premises, I think, can all be separate. And so here is how we would map the, uh, the beginning of our argument map here. We've got our claims still at the bottom, and we've got the uh, five premises arranged there above it, except the two that I'm connecting, uh, I'm going to have to connect with uh, an implied claim. So what is implied when the authors argue that the laws on felon voting are abused to suppress non-felon voters and because election officials officials are secretive about the voting rights, therefore what? And I think this statement covers that perfectly. Elections officials have enforced felon voting laws unjustly. I'm not going to go quite so far as to say illegally, uh, although you know, I think about it, that is some pretty shady stuff and it's probably very illegal. Uh, but I think unjustly covers my bases nicely. So what I have now are four different lines of reasoning here. And now that we have a clearer idea of what our lines of reasoning are, we can go back and paraphrase to make sure that uh, all of the statements are as precise as possible. And I think I definitely want to start with that primary claim. Could we paraphrase, paraphrase rather, a more precise version of the primary claim? Yeah, that word disaster is awfully vague. So what does that word disaster really mean? What do they mean when they say that? I think that while this isn't necessarily more specific, this is a little more precise. Denying felons the right to vote has been harmful to American society. Um, and the way that it's more precise is that when you call something like this a disaster, that's a little figurative. Okay, uh, We want to be as literal as possible, though, when making an argument map. And so literally, it's saying that it's just been harmful to American society. Note also in my map that I went ahead and color-coded that, that second line of reasoning. I just made it all blue. And so now I have my four different lines of reasoning, green, blue, red, and yellow. So that's all I really want you to map with this argument. I just wanted you to get the four lines of reasoning that are supporting that primary claim. Um, after mapping the basic structure, we could continue on and map out the individual arguments in each paragraph. And it would look something like this. But that's not necessary for this exercise. I want you to go and just copy and paste into your notes uh, the, the four lines of reasoning that we've mapped so far. No need to go into all of the examples and map out the rest for this particular exercise. 
Okay, now that we have completed our argument map, go ahead and move on to the next exercise that asks you to respond to the questions uh, that you're given using just one or two complete sentences for each. Okay, number one, based on the argument that we mapped, what is the writer's thesis? Well, for that, we just kind of need to piece together the uh, claim at the bottom and all four of the premises supporting it. So the thesis would be something like this. Denying felons the right to vote has been harmful to American society in that the laws on felon voting are varied and illogical. The laws have been enforced unjustly by election officials. Uh, the laws lack transparency and the laws have become a uh, politically partisan weapon. Number two, what four lines of reasoning do the writers structure uh, do the writers structure their argument around? Hopefully that's pretty clear to you by now. They're color-coded on the argument map we did together. The first line of reasoning is that laws on felon voting are varied and illogical. The second one argues that election officials have enforced felon voting laws unjustly. The third argues that there's this lack of transparency surrounding felon voting laws. And lastly, the fourth one argues that felon voting has become a partisan issue. And number three, what is the big shift that occurs after paragraph six? In other words, how does the writer's argument change starting in paragraph seven? Well, we only analyze one through six for a reason. That's because that is one uh, complete argument. Paragraph seven kind of takes this text in a new direction or a related direction, not a completely new direction. Um, but it starts off with saying the treatment of former felons in the electoral system cries out for reform. The cleanest and fairest approach would be simply to remove the prohibitions on felon voting. So here we see a shift from what the uh, problems have been in the past to what ought to be done in the future. So the the shift that occurs is from all of the uh, is from an argument and evidence uh, that argues how disastrous uh, felon voting laws and restoring felon voting rights has been in the past. Uh, now we shift to the second half, which is arguing what should be done in the future to fix this problem. Okay, moving on to number four. What is the function of paragraph eight within the second half of the text? Well, let's take a look. Paragraph eight starts with restoring the, the vote to felons is difficult because it must be done state by state and because ex-convicts do not have much of a political lobby. So the previous paragraph, paragraph seven, announced that something clearly needs to be done to fix these issues of restoring felon voting rights. And it, it acknowledges that the easiest thing or the, the most complete way would just be to uh, eliminate all laws that bar uh, ex-felons from voting. Paragraph eight, uh, though, kind of qualifies that by saying that doing this would be incredibly difficult because it would have to be done on a state by state level. So the function of paragraph eight is to kind of qualify or limit uh, the argument that was started in paragraph seven. Uh, and as we see, the, the remaining paragraphs, nine through the end, all kind of operate under that assumption that we can't just wipe away the laws uh, as cleanly as we'd like to do. We have to instead acknowledge the difficulty uh, and take smaller baby steps. And that leads us to number five. I kind of just explained it. How do the ideas in paragraphs nine through 11 build off the argument made in paragraph eight? Well, paragraph eight, of course, explains how, how difficult this is going to be and how we're gonna have to take these baby steps and have to accept what we can do in the meantime. And that's what paragraphs nine through 11 do. They explain all of the little things that can be done in the meantime, ultimately uh, with the goal of eliminating these laws that bar fel ex-felons from voting. And that brings us to number six. What do the writers imply ought to be done about felon voting rights? And how does this differ from what the writers actually state that people in power should do? So looking at just the second half, we can see that the writers of this, uh, this argument clearly believe that uh, ex-felons deserve the right to vote and that all laws barring them from voting should be ultimately eliminated. 
However, the actual suggestions that they make in the second half acknowledge the difficulty of the issue, and instead they uh, merely argue that uh, voting rights should not be a political football. It shouldn't be uh, partisan. Instead, both sides, Democrat and Republican, should work uh, together to support efforts to help ex-felons get their voting rights back. So that is kind of what should be done in the immediate sense while the writers want uh, a much want a much larger goal to be accomplished. All right, let's go ahead and move into the practice activity where you're going to do the same sort of things you just did. We're going to map an extended argument and answer some questions. This time over an essay by June Tangney called Condemn the Crime, Not the Person. And so go ahead and pause the video at this time and read that essay in its entirety. When you come back, uh, unpause the video and we'll go ahead and map out the arguments that she makes in paragraphs 4 through 12 and then respond to the study questions that follow. So go ahead and pause this time and read the text. All right, so let's go ahead now that we've read the text, let's start mapping our argument. I'm going to walk you through just the first few uh, boxes and then turn you loose to map the rest of it. Uh, so we're mapping the argument in paragraphs 4 through 12, so let's start with paragraph 4. Looking at paragraph 4, which of those statements is most likely going to be our primary claim? Well, paragraph four is pretty short. It just has two sentences. And of the two sentences, the first one makes more sense as our primary claim. Such attempts at social control are misguided. That second sentence reads more as a reason why they are misguided. Uh, and that's it says, rather than fostering constructive shame, uh, change, shame makes a bad situation worse. So that's the, how these attempts are misguided. So uh, that first statement, uh, such attempts at social control are misguided, that's going to be our primary claim. However, we need to be as precise as possible. Such attempts is kind of ambiguous. What, is, what does the, the author mean by such attempts? Well, they're referring to the use of shame as a punishment for nonviolent crimes. So we want to specify that uh, in our paraphrase of the primary claim. So this might be how the first box would look in our argument map. The use of public shame as punishment for nonviolent crimes is misguided. Yeah, that sounds like a good primary claim to work with. That sounds like what those uh, paragraphs 4 through 12 are trying to argue. So in the first text that we read about felon voting, the lines of reasoning weren't immediately clear. We had to kind of map them out uh, and piece them together to really discover that there was four lines of reasoning supporting the primary claim. And that's just because that particular essay wasn't as cleanly organized uh, as the essay we're looking at now. Uh, this essay, the lines of reasonings are, are, are very clear. The whole argument uh, from paragraphs 4 through 12 is contrary contrasting two things, two emotions. So we need to look for the two different lines of reasoning that make up that contrast. We know that the first line of reasoning that uh, the uh, writer discusses or the writer uses has to do with shame and the effects of shame. Uh, and then the second line of reasoning when they shift gears in the middle there has to do with guilt and the effects of guilt on the individual. So let's let that understanding guide how we map out those lines of reasoning. Uh, we know that the first line of reasoning has to do with shame, so what does the writer argue about shame? Look back through the uh, first few paragraphs in our selection, and let's see if we can't find a good claim that kind of governs the writer's argument about shame specifically. And there we go, right there in paragraph four, right after our primary claim, the author makes their claim about the effects of shame, saying that rather than fostering constructive change, shame often makes a bad situation worse. Okay, we just need to paraphrase that into something like this. Shame does not foster constructive change. That's what the writer's arguing about shame. Now looking at our other line of reasoning, what does the writer argue about guilt? Well, we know it's contrasting shame, so that should kind of help us. So we're looking for kind of a claim that says the opposite about guilt of what the writer was arguing about shame. 
For that, we need to do some more reading. In fact, we need to go all the way to the last paragraph, paragraph 12, which remembers the last paragraph of our selection here, where it says, most important, feelings of guilt are much more likely to foster constructive changes in future behavior. And so here's how we'd write that, that guilt does foster constructive change. So we've got our two contrasting ideas that shame does not and guilt does. So here is the beginning of our argument map. We've got two different premises supporting our primary claim that shame does not foster constructive change while guilt does. And that's all I'm going to give you. I want you to go out on your own, elaborate on these two lines of reasoning, and build out the rest of this argument map. Again, you're going to focus just on arguments in paragraphs 4 through 12. And I do want to warn you about a couple of things with this particular essay. Uh, in this particular essay, the, uh, the writer restates a lot of ideas multiple times in different ways. Uh, and when she does that, uh, she's just kind of reiterating her points, which is something which is a perfectly valid rhetorical choice uh, and helps really clarify her argument. However, when you map those ideas, it's just going to be one box written one time. Okay, so if you start, if you find yourself with a bunch of leftover boxes and you're not really sure where this statement fits, ask yourself, is it maybe just reiterated or repeated from a previous statement? And in that case, you can just delete it because you already have that idea on your argument map. So go ahead and pause the video, uh, build out the rest of your argument map based on those two premises that we've identified. And then when you're done, unpause the video and check your uh, argument map against what I've come up with. And here is my argument map. I've got those two uh, premises that we started with, and I just looked at the two different lines of reasoning. Uh, paragraphs like 5 through 8, I think, dealt with shame, and then 9 through 12 dealt with guilt, something like that. And I just kind of mapped out the arguments uh, that she made there. I did notice a really pleasant uh, sort of parallel construction of the arguments. Uh, I noticed that in the uh, line of reasoning on shame, uh, she argued argues the different uh, feelings that shame causes. And then in the line of reasoning on guilt, she argues the different feelings or motivations that guilt causes. Um, and then she also talks in her line of reasoning about shame, about um, what people resort to when they experience shame. And then in the guilt line of reasoning, she talks about what people uh, resort to when uh, they're filled with guilt. And so there's this lovely kind of parallel construction with her argument, I think, that uh, makes it very clear the distinction between the two. All right, so mapping an argument the right way or correctly honestly isn't that important. There's a lot of different ways that you can map these things out. The important thing is being able to just see how ideas within an argument support other ideas. To be able to see those lines of reasoning, to identify how many there are and what they are in a text, um, and to be able to uh, answer the kind of questions you're asked about on the AP Lang exam, about how such and such paragraph is functioning within an argument, that sort of thing. So at this time, go ahead and move on to the uh, questions, respond to those in one or two complete sentences, and then we'll look at the responses together. All right, number one, based on the argument you mapped, what is the writer's thesis? So if we treated just the argument we mapped, uh, what is the thesis of that? Well, again, we're going to look at the primary claim and kind of combine it with the two uh, premises for the lines of reasoning. So something like uh, punishing nonviolent crimes with public shame is misguided because shame does not foster constructive change. It's guilt that does foster constructive change. All right, well, number two, what lines of reasoning does the writer structure their argument around? Uh, if we got the if question one, then you should have gotten question two. Uh, it's kind of part of question one. Uh, the two lines of reasoning are that shame does not foster constructive change because of all the negative, uh, the, uh, negative focus on self. Uh, and the other line of reasoning is that guilt does foster constructive change because it uh, pushes the negative focus on the action rather than the self. 
All right, lastly, number three, uh, or lastly on this page, what is the function of paragraphs one through three in relation to the argument that you mapped? Well, paragraphs one through three serve to introduce the topic to us. They introduce uh, punishment through shame as a sort of uh, idea that's going around and gaining popularity. And then she comes in with paragraph four and says, wait just a minute, that may not be a great idea. So paragraphs one through three serve to introduce the popularity of this issue of uh, punishment through public shaming. Number four, what argument does the writer shift to making after paragraph 12? And how is this argument supported by the argument that you mapped? Well, the argument that we mapped talked uh, contrasted uh, shame and guilt uh, in the concluding that guilt is the, the real emotion that we want nonviolent offenders feeling because that motivates uh, reparation, uh, those kind of attitudes. Uh, paragraph 12, or excuse me, after paragraph 12, paragraph 13 uh, picks up with uh, how or different ways that, uh, that that can be achieved, different ways that we can uh, create punishments that inspire guilt. And that's kind of the, the function of the rest of the paragraphs there is, is what to do now that we have that information, now that we understand that guilt is what we're really after, how do we act on it? What do we do from there? Number five asks, what is the function of paragraph 16 in relation to the extended argument made in paragraphs 13 through 15? Well, 13 through 15 was all about different ways that we can punish uh, uh, through, uh, through inspiring guilt, that sort of thing. Uh, paragraph 16 comes back with a uh, presenting a counter argument, addressing a counter argument. So anticipating a particular, um, anticipating a particular uh, argument against uh, using, using guilt and then kind of refute or rebutting that. Number six, what seems to be the intended function of paragraph 17? How well does it fulfill its function? Paragraph 17 is the actual, uh, what looks like an attempted refutation of paragraph 16. So while paragraph 16 brings up the counter argument, paragraph 17 seems to actually rebut that counter argument. However, it doesn't really do a very good job because while paragraph 16 talks about um, the potential cheapening of community service, uh, paragraph 17 really doesn't address the cheapening of it at all. It just kind of resorts back to saying that shame is not the way to go, which doesn't quite rebut what it, the the issue that's raised in 17. So all in all, paragraph uh, paragraph 17 is not a very uh, effective refutation of the counter argument in paragraph 16, although it's clear that's what it's trying to do.